Azure Virtual Machines Part 1 Intro by Ali Kararubi Platform as a service is an attractive option for a certain category of workloads. However, not every solution can or should fit within platform as a service model. Some workloads require near total control over the infrastructure. Those services are services such as operating system configuration, disk persistence, the ability to install and configure traditional server software, and so on. This is where the infrastructure as a service and Azure Virtual Machines come to the picture. What is Azure Virtual Machines? Azure Virtual Machines is one of the central features of Azure's infrastructure as a service capabilities. Together with Azure Virtual Networks, they create the IIS capabilities of the Azure. Azure Virtual Machines support the deployment of Windows or Linux Virtual Machines in a Microsoft Azure data center. You have total control over the configuration of the VM. You are responsible for all server software installation, configuration, and maintenance and for operating system patches. Note that the terminology used to describe the Azure Virtual Machines feature and the Virtual Machine instance can be a little bit confusing. Therefore, sometimes Azure Virtual Machines will refer to feature while Virtual Machine or VM will refer to an instance of an actual compute node. There are two primary differences between Azure's platform as a service and infrastructure as a service compute features, persistence and control. In the next slide, we're going to pursue those. As it has been discussed before, Azure App Service and Web Apps platform as a service features such as cloud services, that is web and uh, worker roles, and app services are managed primarily by the Azure platform, allowing you to focus on creating the application and not managing the server infrastructure. With an Azure Virtual Machines VM, you are responsible for nearly all aspects of the VM. Azure Virtual Machines support two types of durable or persistent disks, operating system disks and data disks. An OS disk is required and data disks are optional. The durability for the disks is provided by Azure Storage. More details on these disks will be provided later in the other presentation. But for now, understand the OS disk <clears throat> is where the operating system resides, like Windows or Linux, and the data disk is where you can store other things such as application data, images, and so on. By contrast, Azure Platform as a Service cloud services use ephemeral disks attached to the physical host, the data on which can be lost in the event of failure of the physical host. Because of the level of control afforded to the user and the use of durable disks, VMs are ideal for a wide range of server workloads that do not fit into a platform as a service model. Server workloads such as database server, SQL server, Oracle, MongoDB, and so on, Windows server, Active Directory, Microsoft SharePoint, and many more become possible to run on the Microsoft Azure platform. If desired, users can move such workloads from an on-premises data center to one or more Azure regions, a process often called lift and shift. Azure Virtual Machines is priced on a per hour basis, but it is billed on a per minute basis. For example, you're only charged for 23 minutes of usage if the VM is deployed for 23 minutes. The cost of VM includes the charge of Microsoft operating system. Linux-based instances are slightly cheaper because there is no operating system license charge. The cost? 
and the appropriate licensing for any additional software you install is your responsibility. Some VM images, such as Microsoft SQL Server, you acquire from the Azure Marketplace may include an additional license cost on top of the base cost of the VM. There is a direct relationship between the VM's status and billing. A VM could be in running, stopped, or deallocated status. The VM is on and running normally, which is billable when it is in the running status, and Azure will be billing you per minute in this case. The VM is a stopped but still deployed to a physical host and it is billable in the case it is in the stopped status. Then you have a stopped and deallocated, which in this case the VM is not deployed to physical host and it's not billable. So as you can see, there is only one instance that you will not be billed for having a virtual, a virtual VM instance, and that is a stopped and deallocated. You're charged separately for the durable storage the VM uses. The status of the VM has no relation to the storage charges that will be incurred. Even if the VM is stopped, deallocated, and you aren't billed for the running VM, you will be charged for the storage used by the disks. By default, stopping a VM in the Azure portal puts the VM into a stopped deallocated state, which is not going to be billable. If you want to stop the VM but keep it allocated, you will need to use a PowerShell commandlet or Azure command line interface command. To stop a VM, you can use a stop Azure remote VM command. And actually, in this case, you're keeping it provisioned. And uh, for classic VMs, a similar commandlet stop Azure VM would be used. When using the Azure CLI, there are two commands used to control the stopped state of a VM. One is Azure VM stop, and the other one is Azure VM deallocate. Shutting down the VM from the operating system of the VM itself will also stop the VM, but will not deallocate the VM. And that is one of the common pitfalls that beginners do. They think if they shut it down from within the VM, there's not going to be no billing. So be careful about that. that in this case, the VM will not de be deallocated. The Azure Hybrid Use Benefit Program may offer additional savings by allowing you bring your on-premises Windows Server license to Azure. For more information, please see https forward slash forward slash azure.microsoft.com slash pricing slash hybrid dash use dash benefit forward slash. As of the time of this slide going, Microsoft offers a 99.95% connectivity service level agreement or SLA for multiple instance VMs deployed in an availability set. That means that for the SLA to apply, there must be at least two instances of the VM deployed within an availability set. Additional details pertaining to availability sets for Azure virtual machines are discussed later in this presentation. We can also look at http forward slash forward slash azure.microsoft.com forward slash support forward slash legal forward slash SLA for full details on how these things actually work. As you may remember from earlier discussions, there are two models for working with many Azure resources. One is Azure Resource Manager or ARM, and the other one is Azure Service Management, 
which often is referred to as the classic model or ASM. If you remember when we discussed about how to get started with Microsoft Azure, we talked about these two different types of services in more details. I recommend you to go back and take a look at that if you don't remember what are the major differences between these two. The classic model is still supported, however, the newest innovations will be made available only for the resource manager model. So Microsoft is not actually adding any new technology to the classic model. However, again, you can keep your classic model and you can work with whatever you have deployed under the classic model. For the purpose of this presentation, we talk about both models and we cover both of them. But the emphasis will be on the resource manager model. There are significant and fundamental differences in working with Azure virtual machines in these models. Let's talk about Azure resource manager model. When working with the resource manager model, you have explicit and fine-grained control over nearly all aspects of Azure VM. You will explicitly add components such as a network interface or public IP address, data disks, load balancers, and much more. You may recall that Resource Manager uses various resource providers to enable access to management of Azure resources. There are three main resources and resource providers used when working with Azure Virtual Machines. And those are Network, Storage, and Compute. The Network Resource Provider, or Microsoft.Network, handles all aspects of network connectivity, such as IP addresses, load balancers, network interface cards, and so on. The storage resource provider, or Microsoft.Storage, handles the storage of the disks for a VM in the context of Azure Virtual Machines. The Compute Resource Provider, or Microsoft.Compute, handles details related to the VM itself, such as naming, operating system details, and configuration, like size, number of disks, and so on. In addition to explicit control over the virtual machine's components, you have the ability to take advantage of some other resource manager features, such as deployment and management of related resources as part of a resource group, tags to logically organize and identify resources, role-based access control, RBAC, to apply necessary security and control policies, declarative template files, deployment policies to enforce specific organizational rules, and consistent deployment processes. So let's talk a little bit about classic Azure service management model. In the classic deployment model, VM deployments are always in the context of an Azure cloud service, a container of VMs. The container provides several key features, including DNS endpoint, network connectivity, including from the public internet if desired, security, and the unit of management. While you get these things for free, because they're inherited from the cloud service model, you have limited control over them. Use of the classic model also excludes the use of additional value-adding features available via Azure Resource Manager such as tags, template files, and so on. Like a car, there are many components that make up a virtual machine. Also, like a car, there are multiple configuration options available to suit 
the specific functional needs and desires of the owner. What comes now describes several of the critical components of the Azure virtual machines. Additionally, more advanced configuration options will be discussed later in another video. But first, the base model needs to be established. It is sometimes helpful to think of an Azure virtual machine as a logical construct. A virtual machine can be defined as having status, a specific configuration like operating systems, CPU cores, memory, disks, IP addresses, and so on, and the state. That logical definition can be instantiated by Azure and the appropriate resources can be allocated to bring the VM to life. Azure VMs use attached VHDs to provide durable storage. There are two types of VHDs used in Azure virtual machines, image and disk. A VHD that is a template for the creation of a new Azure virtual machine is called an image. As a template, it does not have settings such as machine name, administrative user, and so on. More information on creating and using images will be provided later in this video. A possibly bootable VHD that can be used as a mountable disk for a VM is called disk. There are two type of disks, an operating system disk and a data disk. Remember, all durable disks, the OS disk and the data disk, are backed by page blobs in Azure storage. Therefore, the disks inherit the benefits of the blob storage, which are high availability, durability, and geo-redundancy options. Blob storage provides a mechanism by which data can be stored safely for use by the VM. The disks can be mounted as drives on the VM. The Azure platform will hold an infinite lease on the page blob to prevent accidental deletion of the page blob containing the VHD. The related container or even the storage account are also protected by this infinite lease. There are two types of major storages in Microsoft Azure virtual machines, standard and premium storage. The disk files or .vhd files can be backed by either standard or premium storage accounts in Azure. Azure Premium Storage leverages solid state disks or SSDs to enable high performance and low latency for VMs running I.O. intensive workloads. Standard storage is available for all VM sizes. And we will discuss what the VM sizes are very soon in this video. While Premium Storage is available for DS, DS version 2, F, and GS series of the VMs only. Standard storage can also be used with DS, DS version 2, F, and GS series VMs, in which case only the local ephemeral drive runs on the SSD and the rest of the information runs off of an HDD. In general, it is recommended to use Azure Premium Storage for production workloads, especially those that are sensitive to performance variations or are I.O. intensive. For development or test workloads, which are often not sensitive to performance variations and are also not sensitive to I.O. intensity, Azure Standard Storage is generally recommended. An OS disk is used precisely as the name suggests for the operating system. 
For a Windows VM, the OS disk is the typical C drive. This is where Windows places its data. For a Linux VM, it hosts the slash dev slash SDA1 partition used for the root directory. The maximum size for an OS disk is currently 1023 gigabytes or almost 1 terabytes. The other type of disk used in Azure Virtual Machine is data disk. The data disk is also used precisely as the name would suggest for storing a wide range of data. The maximum size for a data disk is also 1023 gigabyte or a terabyte. Multiple data disks can be attached to an Azure VM, although the maximum number varies by the VM size, typically two disks per CPU. The data disks are often used for storing application data, such as data belonging to your custom application or server software, such as, let's say, Microsoft SQL Server and the related data and log files. Multiple data disks can be made into a disk, uh, something like a disk array using storage spaces on Windows or MDADM on Linux. Of course, the, these information could change any time according to the upgrades by Microsoft and therefore I always recommend you to go ahead and look at the latest updates that Microsoft actually uh, offers every now and then on the changes in the service. Azure Virtual Machines also include a temporary disk on the physical host that is not persisted to Azure storage. The temporary disk is a physical disk located within the chassis of the server. Depending on the type of the VM created, the temporary disk may be either a traditional hard disk drive or HDD platter or an SSD or solid state drive. The temporary disk should be used only for temporary or replicated data because the data will be lost in the event of a failure of the physical host or when the VM is stopped or deallocated. Look at this figure that shows the various disk types. As you can see, your virtual machine has a local drive, and then there is an OS disk VHD and a data disk DHD, VHD, which basically are uh, virtually on the local drive. Azure VMs reside on a physical server hosted within Microsoft's Azure data centers. As with most physical devices, there is a chance that there could be a failure. If the physical server fails, the Azure VMs hosted on that specific server will also fail. Should a failure occur, the Azure platform will migrate the VM to a healthy host server on which to reconstitute the VM. The service healing process could take several minutes. During that time, the applications hosted on that VM will not be available. Besides hardware failures, the VMs could be affected by periodic updates initiated by Azure platform itself. Microsoft will periodically upgrade the host operating system on which the guest VMs are running. Remember, you're still responsible for the operating system patching of the guest VM that you create. During Microsoft updates, the VM will be rebooted and thus temporarily unavailable. To avoid a single point of failure, it is recommended to deploy at least two instances of the specific VM that you own. In fact, Azure provides an SLA only when two or more VMs are deployed into an availability set. This is a logical feature 
used to ensure that a group of related VMs are deployed so that they're not all subject to a single point of failure and not all upgraded at the same time during the host operating system upgrade in the data center. The first two VMs deployed in an availability set are allocated to two different fault domains, ensuring that a single point of failure will not affect them both simultaneously. Similarly, the first five VMs deployed in an availability set are allocated to five different update domains, minimizing the impact when Azure Platform induces host operating system updates one update domain at the same time. VMs placed in an availability set should perform as an identical set of functionalities. So basically mirroring each other. However, Microsoft is not that generous to give you unlimited number of fault tolerant VMs. The number of fault domains and update domains is different depending on the deployment model, whether resource manager or classic. In the resource manager model, you can have up to three fault domains and 20 upgrade domains. With the classic model, you are limited to two fault domains and five upgrade domains. So basically, you can go anywhere between two to the maximum limit of the availability set limits. So there are two Azure, two type of Azure virtual machines, whether basic or standard. VMs in the basic tier are well suited for workloads that do not require load balancing or the ability to auto scale. VMs in the standard tier support all Azure virtual machine configurations and features. This tier is recommended for most production scenarios. The basic tier contains only a subset of the A series VM sizes, which is from A0 to A4. The standard tier supports all available VM sizes and series, which are A series, D series, DV2 series, F series, G series, and basically everything. There are also variants of the D, DV2, F, and G series sizes called DS, DSV2, F, and GS, which support Azure Premium Storage. Note that with introduction of the F series VM sizes, Microsoft announced a new naming standard for VM sizes, starting with the F series and applying to any future VM sizes a numeric value after the family name will match the number of CPU cores. Additional capabilities such as premium storage will be designated by a letter following the CPU core count. For example, standard F8S will indicate an F series VM supporting premium storage with eight CPU cores, the S indicates premium storage support. This new naming standard will not be applied to previously induced VM sizes. So let's talk about different VM sizes as we went through uh, over during this video a couple of times. We have A series, the traditional sizes that have been around since Azure Virtual Machines was introduced, and these are general purpose virtual machines. D series, introduced in September 2014, they feature processors that are 60% faster than A series, a higher memory to core ratio, 
and an SSD for the temporary physical disk. DV2 series introduced in October 2015, the DV2 series are the next generation of D series instances. They carry the same memory and disk configuration as the D series, yet they are on average uh, almost 35% faster than the D series. Thanks to the 2.4 GHz Intel Xeon E5-2673 version 3 processor, or as commonly known, Haswell processors. G series was introduced in January 2015. The G series VMs are intended for your most demanding workloads. The G series VMs feature two times more memory and four times more storage than D series. And also include the latest Intel Xeon E5 version 3 processors, same as what you see in DV2 series. G series VMs also use SSD for the temporary physical disk. F series introduced in June 2016, the F series uh, provide the same CPU performance, the same 2.4 GHz Intel Xeon E5 uh, version 3 processor as the DV2 series uh, and G series do, but at a lower per hour price. So basically these are the cheaper versions of the G. The difference with the F series is they feature two gigabytes of memory per CPU core and less local SSD space. The F series can be an excellent choice for workloads that might not benefit from additional memory or local SSD spaces that G series or DV2 series provide. And finally, last but not the least, N series Announced in September 2015, the N-Series featured GPU capabilities powered by NVIDIA. At the time of this video, N-Series VMs are limited to a private preview and they're not publicly available. However, they're being considered highly performers as the GPU processing is being customized towards higher performance calculations. In an on-premises physical infrastructure, you may have many components that all allow you to operate your virtual machine in a scalable and secure manner. These components include equipment such as separate network spaces for internet facing and backyard servers, load balancers, firewalls, and more. Many of those components can logically be deployed and implemented in an Azure virtual network. This virtual network often is referred to as a VNet. Azure virtual network provides many similar features such as the following. Subnet, IP address, load balancers, and network security groups. A subnet is a range of IP addresses within a virtual network. A VM must be placed in a subnet within the VNet. VMs placed in one subnet of a VNet can freely communicate with VMs in another subnet of the same virtual network. However, you can use network security groups or NSGs and user-defined routers in order to control such communication. An IP address can be either public or private. Public IP addresses allow communication from the internet to the VM. A public IP address can be allocated dynamically, that is, created only when the associated resource such as a VM or a load balancer is started and released when said resource is stopped, or aesthetically, in which case the IP address is assigned immediately and persists until deleted. Private IP addresses are non-internet routable addresses used for communication with VMs 
and load balancers in the same VNet. VMs are exposed to the internet or other VMs in a VNet by using Azure load balancers. There are two types of D load balancers. External load balancers, which are used for exposing multiple VMs to the internet in highly available manner, and internal load balancers, which are used for exposing multiple VMs to other VMs in the same VNet in a highly available manner. A network security group allows you to create roles that control, like approve or deny, inbound and outbound network traffic to network interface cards or NICs. So they kind of mirror the way that a firewall is working on a locally managed network. When creating a VM in Azure using the resource manager model, it is required that the VM be placed within an Azure virtual network or a VNet. You will decide to use an existing VNet or create a new one. The subnet to use, the IP address, if there is a load balancer or not, the number of network interface cards, and how network security is handled as depicted in this picture, while many other features are out there to set, these are the mandatory features for you to make sure you are defining while creating your VM. While it may seem like a lot just to get a VM deployed, these are important accepts that, that are considered for the accessibility and security of your VM and must be carefully tend to. Classic VMs can also be placed in an Azure virtual network. However, this is not a requirement as it is with VMs in the resource manager model. In the resource manager model, by default, a VM does not have an IP address. One must be explicitly granted to a VM via an associated network interface card. A VM requires an IP address to support communication with other VMs in the virtual network or the public internet. Each network interface card has an associated private address, often referred to as a DIP or dynamic IP, used to connect to the virtual network and is optionally associated with a public IP address connected directly to the public internet. By default, these dynamic IP addresses are lost when the VM is stopped or deallocated. But both may be declared as a static to make them persist unchanged throughout the shutdown or deallocation of the VM. This is useful for VMs that need permanent DIPs such as Microsoft SQL Server, DNS Server Virtual Machines, or permanent public IP addresses. Multiple network interface cards, each with their own DIPs, can be attached to a VM if more than one DIP is needed. For example, to multi-home, a VM in multiple subnets. In the classic model, the story is similar except that network interface cards and public IP addresses can only exist in the context of a VM. That is, they're not independent resources. Furthermore, in the classic model, it is more usual to have internet connectivity provided by the Azure load balancer rather than through a public IP address. As mentioned, the Azure load balancer is used to provide a relatively even distribution of network traffic across a set of often similarly configured or related virtual machines. Using the load balancer allows you to have multiple VMs work together. For example, as a collection of web servers in a web frame and web farm environment, with load balanced set to VMs, incoming requests are distributed across the available VMs instead of being routed to a single VM and overwhelm that single VM or cause a denial of service. 
there are two types of load balancers available in Azure, an external and an internal. An external load balancer is actually the one that connects you to the public networks and the internal load balancer is the one that connects amongst the VMs within the network. The external load balancer is used for distributing traffic from the internet across one or more VMs. This enables you to expose your application in a highly scalable and highly available manner. The internal load balancer is used to distribute traffic from within a virtual network across a set of VMs. For example, this could be traffic to a web API or a database cluster that should be available only to front-end web servers, not the public internet. In the resource manager model, to use a load balancer, several additional items must be first created. A public IP address for the incoming network traffic, a pool of backend IP addresses associated to network interface cards for the VMs, roles to define the mapping of public ports on a load balancer to a port in the backend pool, inbound net roles to define the mapping of a public port on the load balancer to a specific VM in the pool, and health probes to determine if a VM in the pool is healthy. In the classic model, the external load balancer is provided automatically as a part of the cloud service model. All VMs in the cloud service are automatically configured to use the load balancer if they expose a public endpoint. Classic VMs can also use an internal load balancer. A network interface card, or NIC, provides network access to resources in Azure Virtual Network. A NIC is a standalone resource, but it must be associated with a VM to provide network access. A NIC by itself, as it is talking, is of a little value. The maximum number of NICs attached to a VM is dependent on the size of the selected VM. There are several important points to be aware of when working with network interface cards and virtual machines. The IP address for each network interface card on a VM must be located in a subnet of the VNet to which the VM belongs to. If multiple network interface cards are assigned to a virtual machine, only the primary network interface card can be assigned the public IP address. Each network interface card will get assigned a private IP address assuming the network interface card is not the primary NIC and has a public IP address. The NICs can be in a different subnet of the VNet. Any NIC on a VM can be associated with a network security group or NSG. When working with classic VMs, it is not necessary to worry about NIC configuration because that is handled automatically as a part of cloud service model and cannot exist outside the context of a VM. Next, let's talk about network security groups a little bit. Network security groups, or NSGs, allow you to have fine-grained and explicit control over how network traffic flows into or out of Azure VMs and subnets. NSGs allow you to shape the network traffic flow in and out of your environment. You create rules based on the source IP address and port and the destination IP address and port. The NSG rules can be applied to a VM and or a subnet. For a VM, the NSG is associated with the network interface card attached to the same VM.
Azure Virtual Machines, or VMs, are one of several types of on-demand scalable computing resources that Azure offers. Typically, you choose a VM when you need more control over the computing environment than other choices offer. In this video, we give you information about what you should consider before you actually create a virtual machine, how you create it, and how you manage it. An Azure VM gives you the flexibility of virtualization without having to buy and maintain the physical hardware that runs it. However, you still need to maintain the VM by performing tasks such as configuring, patching, and installing the software that runs on it. Azure Virtual Machines can be used in various ways. Some examples are development and tests, applications in the cloud, and extended data center. Azure VMs offer a quick and easy way to create a computer with a specific configuration required to code and test an application, which in this case, for any development and test application, you can easily use an Azure Virtual Machine. Because demand for your application can fluctuate, it might make economic sense to run it on a VM in Azure. You pay for extra VMs when you need them and shut them down when you don't. Virtual machines in Azure can easily be connected to your organization network and that gives you a huge benefit on the connectivity side. The number of VMs that your application uses can scale up and out to whatever is required to meet your needs at the time. The question that may arise is, what do I need to think about before creating a virtual machine? There are always a multitude of design considerations when you build out an application infrastructure in Azure. These aspects of a VM are important to think about before you start. The names of your application resources, the location where the resources are stored, the size of the VM, the maximum number of VMs that can be created, the operating system that the VM runs, the configuration of the VM after it starts, and the related resources that the VM needs. Speaking of naming, a virtual machine has a name assigned to it and it has a computer name configured as part of the operating system. The name of a VM can be up to 15 characters. If you use Azure to create the operating system disk, the computer name and virtual machine name are the same. If you upload and use your own image that contains a previously configured operating system, and use it to create a virtual machine, the name can be different. I recommend that when you upload your own image file, you make the computer name in the operating system and the virtual machine name the same to avoid future confusions and future problems that may arise from having two different names. It is always easier to remember one name rather than two. Regarding the locations, all resources created in Azure are distributed across multiple geographical regions around the world. Usually, the region is called location when you create a VM. For a VM, the location specifies where the virtual hard disks are stored. Regarding the size of the VM, the size of the VM that you use is determined by the workload that you want to run. The size that you choose then determines factors such as processing power, memory, and storage capacity. Azure offers a wide variety of sizes to support many type of uses. Azure charges an hourly price based on the VM size and operating system. For partial hours, Azure charges only for the minutes used. Storage is priced and charged separately for sure. Regarding the limits, your subscription actually 
has a default quota limits in place that could impact the deployment of many VMs for your projects. The current limit on a per subscription basis is 20 VMs per region. Limits can be raised by filing a support ticket requesting an increase. Of course, in that case, Microsoft will charge you differently. Virtual machines use virtual hard disks or VHDs to store their operating system and data. They always use VHDs. VHDs are also used for the images you can choose and install as an OS. Azure provides many marketplace images to use with various versions and types of Windows Server operating systems. Marketplace images are identified by Image Publisher, Offer, SKU, and Version, which typically version is specified as latest. Only 64-bit operating systems are supported. This is important to remember 32-bit operating systems are not welcome to Azure. For more information on supported suggested operating system roles and features, I always recommend you to check Microsoft documentation before you try a new type of operating system upload. Let's talk a little bit about the extensions. VM extensions give your VM additional capabilities through post-deployment configurations and automated tasks. There are some common tasks that can be accomplished using extensions. Tasks such as run custom scripts, deploy and manage configurations, and collect diagnostic data. The custom script extension helps you configure workloads on the VM by running your script when the VM is provisioned. The PowerShell Desired State Configuration, or DSC, helps you set up DSC on a VM to manage configuration and environments. The Azure Diagnostics extension help you configure the VM to collect diagnostic data that can be used to monitor the health of your application. The resources that you see in the current table are used by the VM and need to exist or be created when a VM is created. You need to have a resource group. So the VM must be contained in a resource group. You need to have a storage account. So the VM needs the storage account to store its virtual hard drives into. You need to have a virtual network so that your VM be a member of a virtual network. You need to assign a public IP address to the VM. This is not mandatory. It is necessary just in case you want your computer to be accessible. So the VM can have a public IP address assigned to it to remotely access. You need to have a network interface. That's a mandatory. The VM needs the network interface to communicate in the network, so you usually have the local network of yourself within the Azure, and without the network interface, you don't have a VM. However, you can have no public IP address assigned to your VM, which means it is not accessible publicly through the web. And other characteristics, another resource, which is not mandatory, but it's always good to exist in your VM is data disks. The VM can include data disks to expand storage capabilities. So let's talk about how do we create our first VM. You have several choices for creating your VM. The choice that you make depends on the environment you're in. The table that you're looking at right now provides information to get you started creating your VM. You can either do it through the Azure portal, which we're going to do it in this class. You can do it through the templates, which is going to use uh, Microsoft virtual machines 
with a resource manager template. You can use the Azure PowerShell and use the command lines in order to get this creation done. You can use client SDKs, which basically is deploying Azure resources using C Sharp. We can use REST APIs, or you can use the Azure CLI itself. You hope it never happens, but occasionally something goes wrong. If this situation happens to you, you can easily look up in different troubleshoot resources that Microsoft has uploaded as documentation for Azure. So let's think about it. How do we manage the VMs after we create them? VMs can be managed using a browser or using the CLI PowerShell. If you use PowerShell or the portal online on the web, no matter which one to use, you can have access to all the capabilities of Microsoft Azure to manage the VMs. Some typical management tasks that you might perform are getting information about a VM, logging on to a VM, managing availability, and making backups. The table you're looking at right now shows you some of the ways that you can get information about a VM. You can go to the Azure portal, on the hub menu, you can click on machines and then select the virtual machine from the list. And on the blade for Microsoft virtual machines, you have access to overview information, setting values, changing values, monitoring metrics, looking at the cost, and so on and so on. You can use Azure PowerShell for information about using PowerShell, look at the video that I already have uploaded and see how to set it up. You can use REST API, use the get VM information operation to get information about a VM, and you can use client SDKs. Last but not the least again is the Azure CLI. So after you create your virtual machine, next step is going to be logging onto the VM. You use the connect button in the Azure portal to start a remote desktop session or an RDP. Things can sometimes go wrong when trying to use a remote connection. If the situation happens to you, again, you can go back to the information Hosted in the Troubleshoot Remote Desktop Connection to an Azure Virtual Machine running Windows on the Microsoft Documentation website. Let's talk a little bit about managing the availability of your virtual machine. It's important for you to understand how to ensure high availability for your application. This configuration involves creating multiple VMs to ensure that at least one is running. In order for your deployment to qualify for your 99.95 VM service level agreement, you need to deploy two or more VMs running your workload inside an availability set. This configuration ensures your VMs are distributed across multiple fault domain and are deployed onto hosts with different maintenance windows. You can always go online and check the Azure SLA, which explains the guaranteed availability of an Azure as a whole. But the rule of the thumb is if you only have one VM, Microsoft does not certify 99.95% VM service level agreement that they have. Minimum of two, is required in order to be able to get that number. Like any other operating system for enterprise use or commercial use, you need to back up the VMs on the Azure. 
A recovery service vault is used to protect data and assets in both Azure Backup and Azure Site Recovery Services. You can use a recovery service vault to deploy and manage backups for resource manager deployed VMs using the PowerShell. This basically gets us to the point of a start creation of a VM. Okay, uh, let's start creating our first virtual machine. So first you need to log in to your Azure instance. Um, right now, as you can see, I'm already logged in. Uh, by this point, you must have an account or you cannot uh, follow the information and instructions from this point on. If you have any questions regarding how to create an account, please uh, search for the video named uh, How to Create a Free Account with Microsoft Azure and follow the steps in that video. So I want you to go to create a resource up here and click on it. And from the search box, we're going to look for server 2016 data center and choose the data center. So um, just go ahead and switch this to the resource manager. Take a look at what you're installing. So you're installing Windows Server 2016 data center, which is a comprehensive server actually um, that, that we're gonna use mostly in this class. Uh, the image can be used with Azure hybrid benefit for Windows Server. We're gonna discuss what this is in near future. Uh, some legal terms that you can go ahead and uh, read or just simply save it for later read. Publisher is Microsoft and documentation is available here. I always encourage you to click on the documentation, go there and read everything that they have to offer about this specific operating system VM. Introducing to Windows 2000 Server 2016 again. Um, it's going to help you understand the Windows itself and what's new and learn more. So this basically are for your further uh, study by your own. At this point, I want you to click on Create. And your instance is going to be created. So in the Basics tab, let's go under Project Details. Again, I'm in under the Basics tab after creation of the resource. And then I'm going to the project details and I want you to make sure the correct subscription is selected and uh, then uh, choose create new. But look at it. So the subscription that I have is a free trial. As you can see, there is no other option for me as of now. If you are planning on keeping this copy of Microsoft Windows Server 2016 data center in future, don't worry you're going to have it for free. So the resource group, uh, you can create your own groups. It doesn't matter what group you actually create. Uh, it's going to help a lot in uh, managing your resources over here. So I create a new group and name it test VMs for, sorry, for CCSF. And basically, click OK on that. Now it's going to be under that resource group. Next step is naming the virtual machine. But I want you to notice what the requirements that Microsoft has assigned for naming the virtual machine. So virtual machine name cannot contain non-ASCII or special characters. So that is, that is sometimes funny, but this is something to put into consideration. The virtual machine name must be unique in the current resource group. And remember, this is the resource group that we are talking about, which is the test VMs for CCSF. So that means if you have two different resource groups, you can have the same names, um, the exact same name within those two groups, and there, there's not going to be no problem. Uh, coming back here, I'm going to go ahead and start naming it to see it again. So the value should be between 1 to 15 characters. So to, to make stuff easy, I just put it down 2016 server data center. As you can see, it has one more character. Uh, actually, I'm going to keep it at 2016 server. So 
as long as you're meeting all these requirements, you're good to go and you should not have no problem. So the region is going to be um, East US as of now, but if, if you like to put it in any other region, then you're more than welcome. It is okay to put it in any region that you want. Um, I keep East US as I always had good experience with that region. And the availability options, as you can see, you can put it in an availability set. Remembering from the lecture, remember if you want to put it in an availability set, that means you're going to have two different servers that must be added over here to back each other up. So as of now, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone like that. I don't really care about this to be available as this is just a test. And the image is already selected. If you like to select any other image, you can look for those images over here. But I'm going to keep 2016 data center. So this is exactly like when you're using your hypervisor on your desktop and you introduce an ISO. So this basically is going to be that ISO. So scrolling down, you're going to get to your administrative account. Before I get there, look at the size that is assigned to the virtual hard drive over here. So under the administrator account, you want to um, introduce a local admin. So I'm going to call it CNIT admin. Again, look at the requirements for the name. So username cannot contain special characters. Username must not include reserved words and the value should be between 1 to 32 characters long. I have seen a lot of people not considering the limits uh, on username, passwords and such and such that get to different problems and complain about my my Azure instance doesn't work and so on and so on. So always read the documentation when you are a beginner with Microsoft Azure. Later down the road, then you can simply ignore those as you already know them. So the password again has the same type of requirement that you're gonna read to it and there you go I actually prefer to put it like that and there you go so I have it over there and then I'm gonna confirm the password And the passwords match. Um, always remember what you have over here as username and passwords. As uh, recovery is a little bit uh, not not uh, let's say amazing. So it's good to remember that. Take a note somewhere. So after you have uh, passwords and everything set up, then you have to go for inbound and outbound rules. So we define these rules based on uh, what we are uh, planning to do with this instance of Windows Server 2016 Data Center. Uh, because we want to remotely connect to it, I'm going to go ahead and allow some ports for our connection. And you can actually guess that I want to open up the RDP and HTTP. So HTTP is open and RDP is open so I can remotely connect to it again this is something that you have to remember and consider if you don't open up those over here and um, forget to change them later in the configurations it is not going to be possible to remotely connect to those especially the RDP and HTTP in this case so I want you to leave the remaining settings which is the save money um, aside uh, here is asking you if you have uh, a license to Microsoft Windows Server so it can give you some discounts as of now we don't pay for this instance anyway so just click on uh, next let me just get rid of this save actually I'm gonna save it it may be useful for future so uh, create a virtual machine we have either premium SSD a standard SSD or standard HDD. This is referring to the actual physical device that Microsoft is going to assign to you on their own servers. So since we're not paying anything, I'm going to keep premium SSD for this case. It's not going to cost me anything, so it doesn't matter. 
and then um, the data links over here uh, I want you to just leave it as is and under the networking as you can see everything is already set up for this specific uh, server just don't touch anything don't change anything you're going through these pages so that you can have an idea of what is included but I don't want you to change anything over there because um, but the defaults we can actually do whatever we want in this class guest config uh, is disabled and finally the tags if you want to add a tag which we're going to talk about this later when we talk about the pricing so finally click on review plus create and here we go and as you can see the validation passed so we validated this specific server remember one thing um, the credit that we apply is uh, almost like 12 cents an hour for having this working so that's that's good to know that the prices from Microsoft are not that expensive but at the same time if you keep the server up and running at all the times you're gonna pay a hefty amount of money in the long run so take advantage of that $200 free credit that you have for the 30 days which is a good good amount of time to do some practices around and learn through that um, and then after that uh, make sure that you, you know you know how much you're paying okay very good so it, it is it is important to have those in mind anyway uh coming down here the subscription is free trial you are good with that the resource group was the one that i generated test vms for ccsf virtual machine name 2016 server is again what i created the region is east us again i want you to keep this east us you're going to get much better performance especially considering the location we are in Availability options, um, I didn't add no infrastructure redundancy over there. Uh, username, CNIT admin, the public protocols available are HTTP and RDP, and already have a Windows license. No, I don't have it. We wanted premium SSDs, use managed disk, yes, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I'm happy with all the reviewed information over here, so I click on create. That's going to initialize the deployment, uh, submitting the deployment. As you can see, these are all time tagged. So now my instance is actually up and running with, within a couple of seconds as soon as this guy is over. As you can see, it's still working. So what you can see is under the deployment details. So you can see the duration that um, I'm having this up and running is going up so very simple my deployment is over there and I'm good to go at this point since we're gonna go back and forth to this page a lot of time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this button over here to pin it to my dashboard so every time I go back to my dashboard I can actually see um, uh, this page quickly and uh, just jump into it so now that our instance is actually deployed as you can see it says your deployment is complete now we can go ahead and try to uh, remotely connect to it uh, before we move there I want you to look at this list over here I have my resources my group and everything up and running this is what we love to see so Anytime you see an orange over here, and don't worry, we're going to go over every single instance later and discuss what does it mean. But every time you see an orange here, which means something is not working. Red, it's broken. It needs your attention. So if, if you go through other steps throughout the labs in this course and you figure out something is not happening, you cannot connect somewhere or do something over there, come back and make sure your deployment is uh, going well and I can click here to go to the resource which is going to be my 2016 server so uh, we're going to discuss how everything in here is going to work however for now let's just go back and get ready to remotely connect to this deployment of Microsoft Windows Server okay uh, so let's start from how to get access to our virtual machine let's say you just logged in 
to your home page and you want to get access to your virtual machine and look at how is it um, doing you need to go here to the resource groups and through those resource groups you're going to see all the resource groups that you already have created if you remember I created this test VMs for CCSF so I click on that and under the resources within this group I have everything that Microsoft assigned to me which all of them are actually in uh, in a package to run 2016 server my machine so I click on that and it opens up the 2016 server with all the properties so basically this view that you're looking at is called the server property you can stop the server restart it or um, simply just delete it refresh it capture the situation and other other stuff to do to this server you can also see the CPU usage of the server as of right now so to continue I'm gonna come back here I want you guys to click on the connect to get to this page and uh, and this connect to virtual machine page okay I want you to keep the default options to connect by DNS name over port 3389 so this is something that I want you to keep for now do not change anything do not do anything specific to it SSH is gonna stay the same so after you have this setting over here again make sure this is correct I want you to click on the download RDP file okay now that the RDP file got downloaded we just need to use an RTP client remove the sub client in order to get connected to this instance uh, yeah you see this because I just stopped and started restarted my server just to make sure it's working properly before the next step anyway um, for those of you who have Windows so just the game is very easy you have uh, everything in there if you're a Mac user you're gonna need to download a remote desktop client so just in case let me just pretty much pull up uh, this guy over here so very simple go to your um, app store on the Mac and put in remote uh, desktop client the, the latest version is 10 which is this guy uh, click on get and of course install it on your computer so now that we have the connection file the RDP file and uh, the remote desktop application set up either on Mac and click on the connection file which is going to ask us for the username password at this point you want to put in the username password that you actually created while creating this instance of server 2016 uh, let's hope I still remember my password and it's gonna tell you that the certificate is not valid just click on continue and accept it's configuring the remote PC and let me just minimize it so we can see it and then we are in the process of getting connected to the remote desktop so now we are connected uh, to the Microsoft Windows Server it's a remote connection and as you can see uh, it has all the familiar interface that you know from Windows Server 2016 so uh, that pretty much is it um, as easy as you just noticed we created an instance of 2016 server and we remotely get connected to it uh, through our RDP client and then from here you can go wherever you want and you can do whatever you want with that so I'm gonna go back to our interface and stop the server as you know every second is gonna be money now so click on stop it's asking me if I want to stop my virtual machine stop it as you can see I can get the message over there and let's go back as soon as it's over we're gonna go back to the home and that concludes this uh, video 
Um, good luck with practicing it yourself. Try to do a couple of time. It's very easy. It's just uh, going through steps. And I'm pretty sure you guys are going to be successful in this.